One Saturday morning years ago, our son Alex, who was about four years old at the time, was on the sofa watching TV. He was on his knees, and at some point he leaned forward to put his hands on the coffee table. I imagine Thomas the Tank Engine or Bob the Builder was facing some dangerous situation. But there was a thin book on the edge of the table. And as he landed, the book slid off and Alex went down with it, hitting the corner of his eye on the table. He had a really deep cut and I was pretty sure he needed stitches. I panicked for a moment. My husband was out of town and I didn't have a car because it was being serviced. But I ended up racing out the back of our house with Alex and our two-year-old daughter into the first open door I saw. I rushed in and I said, Ramona, I need you to take Emily and give me your car keys so I can get Alex to the emergency room. Thank goodness she was there to help. At the time, we lived in a neighborhood outside of Madrid, Spain. It was a community of eight townhouses. There were four on each side with small yards that opened onto a common yard and a pool. Now, this provided constant opportunities for connection. We would see our neighbors as we were coming and going and share what we were up to. We would organize get-togethers like potluck dinners in the summertime. I remember the most memorable one was actually when, when the sprinklers went off in the middle of our dinner, and you should have seen us all scrambling to save the food. Our children were always in one of the neighbor's houses or sometimes just chilling in the yard. Now, I do have to admit that living in such close proximity to others can have its downsides. We didn't always agree on what needed to be done for the upkeep of the yard or the pool. The neighbor's dog barking right outside my bedroom window on a Saturday morning did not make me very happy. And I'm still not sure why Ramona thought getting a rooster would be a good idea, but for the most part, it was wonderful. I realize now the positive impact living in such a close community had on my well-being. As the mother of young children struggling to earn tenure in a university in a foreign country, I was pretty stressed out a lot of the time. The relationships that I had with, with my neighbors really made all the difference. As a psychologist, several years ago, I became interested in the study of well-being. And what I've learned is that much of our well-being is up to us. It depends on what we pay attention to, what we focus on. And at each moment of the day, we have a choice about where to focus. So what should we be focusing on? Well, research shows that relationships are the most important factor for our well-being. A well-known Harvard study of adult development that tracked over 700 men for 75 years found that those who were more socially connected were happier, healthier, and lived longer. Another study showed that when you ask somebody what gives their lives meaning, the overwhelming response is a relationship. People matter for our well-being. But we're less connected socially than we ever have been. We spend less time with our family and friends. We're less likely to know our neighbors. And we belong to fewer organizations. One in three American adults 45 years or older say that they're lonely. And in a survey that asked how many people are there in your life with whom you can discuss important matters, the overwhelming response was zero. Most people said there's not a single person in their lives who they feel close enough to to share something important with. Connecting with others does take time and effort, but your well-being depends on it. So be intentional about connecting with people. Schedule dinners with friends. Join book clubs. Don't eat lunch alone at your desk. And the next time you move, remember that your happiness depends more on having nice neighbors or friends nearby than it does on the size of your house. Connecting with others boosts your well-being. But helping people has an even stronger impact. Giving is good for your health and your happiness. Brain scans show that when we think about helping others, the region of the brain associated with pleasure is activated. And in studies where people are given money, and some are asked to spend it on others, and some are asked to spend it on themselves, the people who spend money on others are happier. Now, living so close to our neighbors in Madrid provided lots of opportunities for us to help one another out, 
like when Ramona watched Emily and lent me her car. If Kristen had to work late, I'd make dinner for her daughter, Emma. When Marie Cruz and Jose were out of town, I'd water their plants and watch their cat feed their cat. They were small things, but it really made me feel better to know that I was making a difference. There are countless opportunities each day to do small acts of kindness. I still remember a few years ago racing to catch a train in the San Francisco metro station, dragging my suitcase behind me. A man stopped me to ask if I was heading to the airport. And when I said I was, he said, the train I was about to board was not stopping at the airport. I needed to wait for the next train. And it was such a small thing for him to do, but I probably would have missed my flight if I had taken the wrong train. Look for ways that you can serve others. Help someone out at work. Buy coffee for a friend. And the next time someone wants to help you, let them. Give them the gift of giving. At each moment in the day, you have a choice. Build your well-being by choosing to focus on people. Now, looking back at my time in, in Spain, I realized how fortunate I was to live in such a tight-knit community. The happiness and opportunity to serve others that, that those relationships provided really increased my well-being. But I did some things that weren't so great for my well-being. When I was hanging out with my neighbors, I spent a lot of the time complaining. I would go over to Rosa's at the end of the long day to have a caña, which is a small beer and some tapas. And as we watched the kids playing in the yard, I would talk about all the exams I had to grade and how much I hated it. I would moan about the fact that my daughter's cough had kept me awake all night long. I'd complain that my husband wasn't around enough to help me out with the kids. There was always something, and it was mostly negative. You know, I thought sharing my frustrations would make me feel better. But dwelling on the problems just brought negative emotions to what should have been a wonderful moment of connection. I now know how much happier I would have been if I had focused on the positive. I could have noticed the bright yellow daffodils that had just started to bloom, or commented on how nice it was that the weather was finally warm enough for us to sit outside. I could have asked Rosa to tell me about that exciting new project at work. We all have a natural tendency to dwell on the negative. Our brains have a survival instinct that keeps us constantly on the lookout for problems or potential threats. But that can lead to chronic stress that hurts our well-being. When we focus on what's good in our lives, that generates positive emotions. And positive emotions boost our well-being by reducing stress and anxiety, increasing resilience, and improving our physical health. Now, our negativity bias makes it more likely that we notice the bad, but we have a choice about what we pay attention to. We can choose to focus on the positive. Research in neuroscience shows that our brains change in response to our experiences. So when you focus on the positive, each time you do that, the neural circuits in your brain associated with positive experiences fire together. And each time they fire together, those neural connections become stronger, which means they're more likely to fire together in the future. So by focusing on the good, you can rewire your brain so that over time it naturally notices more of what's good. You know, the same thing happens in your brain when you learn to play a musical instrument or, or a sport. Playing the piano is a good example. The first time you try to play, your brain has to work really hard to read the notes and find them on the keys and move your fingers in the right order to the right notes. But each time you practice, the neural pathways in your brain associated with reading the music and playing the notes fire over and over again. That makes it eventually automatic, so that eventually you can play more and more difficult music. Now, a simple intervention for focusing more on the positive is the three good things exercise. All you have to do is write down three things that went well during the day before going to sleep at night. Doing this exercise each night pushes your brain to look for good things throughout the day. It helps direct your attention toward the positive. Now, something else you can do is to use complaining as a reminder to redirect your attention. I mentioned how much I hate grading exams. 
I imagine most professors would agree with me that it's not the best part of our jobs. But focusing on how much I hated it just made an unpleasant task even worse. So when I'd start to complain, I'd tell myself to stop, and I'd shift my attention to all the things I loved about being a professor. I'd make a mental list of how much I enjoyed teaching my classes, discovering something through my research, interacting with my colleagues and students. I had a choice about which parts of my job to pay attention to. So do you. At each moment, you have a choice. Build your well-being by choosing to focus on the positive. Now, something else I did that hurt my well-being was to spend so much of my time worrying. Just as there was always something to complain about, well, there was always something to worry about. I can't tell you how creative I can be in coming up with different ways that things can go wrong. A simple plan to shop at Ikea the next day can keep me awake at night. I mean, DIY projects in our household can be a disaster. But it turns out that I'm not the only one who wastes a lot of time worrying or ruminating. Harvard researchers found that on average, our, brain, our minds wander 47% of the time. That means about half of you are not listening to what I'm saying right now. But what's more interesting is the study showed that we're less happy when our minds wander. Dwelling on bad things that have happened in the past or fretting about something that might go wrong in the future is the source of much of our unhappiness. Our internal world can have a bigger impact on our well-being than our external circumstances. But you can try to minimize these stressful thoughts by directing your attention away from things like fear and regret and focusing instead on the present moment. Okay, now I know what you're thinking. Stopping all the worry and rumination is a lot easier said than done. Believe me, as one of the world's biggest worriers, I know. The first step is just to recognize that you will be happier if you spend more time focused on the present moment. Set an intention to stay present. And you will start noticing when your mind has wandered off or you've become distracted by your phone. And you can shift your awareness back to the moment. Just like focusing on the positive, the more you practice redirecting your attention, the, the more those neural circuits associated with focused attention fire and the stronger they become. What you practice grows stronger. That's why the very best way to strengthen your attention muscle is through mindfulness meditation. The process of focusing your attention on something like your breath and bringing it back each time your mind wanders, even for a few minutes a day, builds your ability to stay focused. And meditation has other benefits, too. It's been linked to emotional stability, an enhanced immune system, and lower levels of anxiety and depression. Another way to stay present is to do one thing at a time. It's the only way to really focus on something. So when you're talking to someone, put away your phone and really listen to what they're saying. If you're writing a report, turn off your email and social media so that you can give it your undivided attention. And when you're preparing dinner, pay attention to the process of cooking, especially when you're chopping something. We enjoy even mundane tasks more when we're truly present. Our lives are richer and happier when we fully engage in our experiences. At each moment, you have a choice. Build your well-being by focusing on the present moment. I'd like to end with one more story in my, of my time living in the suburbs of Madrid. On most days when I got home from work, I'd take the kids to the park down the street. They would run off and play with their friends while I sat on a bench, my highlighter in hand, reading the latest article on knowledge sharing or whatever subject I happened to be researching at the time. Now, I, I did look up occasionally to make sure that they were okay, but that was it. And this is before we had smartphones. If I could do it over again, I would take that time to disconnect from work and enjoy being with my children. I'd push them in the swing and I would cheer as they went down the slide. I'd be present for those moments, those precious moments with the people I love most dearly. I'll never have those moments back. 
The choices you make moment to moment throughout the day about what you pay attention to impact your well-being. Choose to focus on people. Choose to focus on the positive. Choose to focus on the present moment. And you will thrive. Thank you.